Hello. Today I wanted to talk again about um, life elsewhere in the universe, um, but this time about the feasibility of interstellar travel, because obviously one of the big questions that um, Enrico Fermi uh, raised was if there are so many stars out there with planets, which there seem to be, surely some of them would have generated life and surely at least one of them somewhere would have gone out exploring the galaxy and would have got here and probably would have colonized all the suitable planets including ours um, if they have the advanced technology to survive on a world like this with the wrong sorts of food supplies and uh, so on for them but anyway um, given that it's a suitable planet they could have made it suitable for themselves uh, with their advanced technology so where are they, basically? Um, and I know there are UFOs. Um, but I've got another video about that. <laughs> and I might make another, a further one. Um, basically, my opinion on the UFOs boils down to uh, the evidence just isn't good enough. I mean, fuzzy photos and videos, which could be faked. Um, and... Um, a small percentage of unexplained cases does not constitute good enough evidence that the aliens are here. Um, and there are lots of reasons why they shouldn't be here right now, but maybe a few million years ago, after all, they've had lots of time. Uh, so how come they're here now, anyway? Um, and so on. <clears throat> there's, there's endless arguments against it, really. Um, I might do a more thorough one, another one, as I say. Um... For now, I'm assuming that UFOs mean they aren't here, but even if they are, how would we go out exploring? Now, the point of this argument is to show whether interstellar travel looks like it's feasible, basically. Um, <clears throat> we know the distances are vast. Um, could we, with our primitive technology, or with foreseeable uh, improvements to our current technology, could we actually go and colonise another star system? Would we actually be able to do it at all? Or when we try and look at the engineering difficulties, is it so difficult that it's not even conceivable? And <clears throat> obviously there are difficulties. Journey time is one of them, of course. Um, you're looking at um, a lifetime or two uh, typically. Um, but there are people who might be willing to do that. Um, so people who are sick to death of the earth, <laughs> maybe or just with a great exploring spirit and want to go. So, And there are people, perhaps, depending on the culture of the time, who could be bribed to go, etc, etc. Um, anyway, um, me, I don't think I'd want to go because I like this place, actually. Um, I mean, it would be nice to have gone um, and go to a place where it's already uh, a luxury civilization, maybe, but I don't really want to go to some dusty old solar system and start building a camp, you know, a, a, um, a habitation module. Um, because when it starts, it's going to start small and primitive, and I don't fancy that really. Um, but there are people who will like it, so fine. But the question is, how would we get there? Um, and I've been looking at this book. It's called Extraterrestrials, Where Are They? And it's edited by Zuckerman and Hart. Oops, can you see it? There we go. Zuckerman and Hart. <coughs> and it's published, this is the second edition, reprinted 1996. <coughs> the technology in it is pretty much up to date. In fact, um, these these are articles by astronomers and physicists and people like that trying to work out the feasibility of extraterrestrial life and all this sort of thing. It's a very good book. Quite technical, lots of maths in it. Um, but if you're not into maths, you can skip it and still get the gist of it because um, obviously they tell you what they're talking about. But what I want to discuss is spaceships. How would we get a spaceship to another star system? Um, <clears throat> there's one method in particular which looks like it's going to be the most practical at the moment, 
Um, I'll just briefly mention others. Um, one is the pulsed thermonuclear bomb and pusher plate concept outlined by Dyson. I suppose that's Freeman Dyson. Um, in 1968, yep, um, which basically you load up the ship with thermonuclear fuel, nuclear bombs in other words, hydrogen bombs effectively, and you drop them out the back of the spaceship, bang, they go off and they push the spaceship along, right. This, believe it or not, is considered to be feasible, <laughs> right. Um, you'd have to have a good deal of radiation shielding against the, all the particles which they blast out. Um, and that's maybe the second most feasible concept. Uh, one issue with it is you would have to carry a lot of nuclear fuel, um, and that makes it a little difficult. Um, another issue is that all that radiation, but you're going to need that probably um, anyway. Um, another engine is the microfusion engine. This is where, um, you get, again, you have your thermonuclear fuel and it's blasted by um, high intensity electron beams. They all come in from all angles, compress the particles, or your, your matter, your fuel, which is crushed and undergoes nuclear fusion and explodes like a star, bang, inside your spaceship. And that generates your fuel and your thrust um, a big issue with this method is that it generates an enormous number of high-intensity neutrons, um, which will probably kill your crew, basically. Um, you can't shield very easily against neutrons. You can have beryllium and stuff to try and reflect them, but you won't capture them all. And um, it's um, maybe not going to be feasible unless they are exploded maybe a long way away from the ship at the end of a long long pole maybe I don't know but how far I don't know. it seems dubious basically um, and we haven't got such a system to work yet either of course um, we can we can blow up hydrogen bombs um, but um, the fusion engine whilst technically feasible hasn't been made to work yet um, The other way is to use a super powerful laser beam to push the spaceship. So we have a laser beam shooting from Earth or from the Moon, pointing at the back of the spaceship basically, and we blast it and push it out into space. The point about this is we're trying to get our spaceship there in a reasonable time, so we need it to travel at maybe 10% of the speed of light. It needs to be getting up to slightly relativistic velocities. Um, the issue with this is you would need um, a laser beam generator 100 square kilometers uh, in area and it would have to be accurate one part in 10 to the 11 for aiming at the spaceship when it's a long way away. Um, that's one part in 100,000 million in terms of accuracy and it's not actually clear that we that such a thing is, is buildable. It may be, we can certainly build laser beams, but can we make them that powerful and that accurate? Don't know. A big problem also with the laser beam spaceship is you can speed it up, but how do you slow it down when you get to the other end? You'd need a second method as well. Maybe the hydrogen bombs, something. But you need a lot of them, but maybe, maybe that's a possibility. Um, there is another method, though, which kind of combines the benefits of these other methods and is, in some sense, is more primitive and therefore more practical. And this is the mass driver system. Um, before I go on to that, though, there's one more, which NASA this week has announced the result of an experiment. They've been testing the electromagnetic engine lately. Um, and this is something which appears to be impossible. <laughs> However, they've been testing it because it was it was discovered by a proper scientist. Um, and so they've got to test it to see if it works. And they've tested it. And although they can't figure out how it works, it works. 
Um, the problem with the engine is that it violates Newton's laws of motion, or it appears to, because it generates thrust, but it's not sending particles out the back. What you do is bounce microwaves backwards and forwards inside a sealed cav cavity, and somehow you get thrust out of that. Um, it looks like it might require um, a reinterpretation of the way quantum mechanics works to explain this engine, possibly. So it's brand new. Nobody really understands how it works, but it does produce thrust. A small amount of thrust, but more thrust than a solar sail would, for example, as it happens. Um, so it's feasible as an interstellar engine if it can be made to work and scaled up. You would have to carry a lot of fuel to generate microwaves or use solar panels or whatever, at least while you're in a star system. Um, but that's another, this is a possible other method, maybe. Obviously more experiments have to be done to really prove whether it really does work or is there something wrong with the experiments that have been done already. Although obviously NASA has been working on it for a few years and has been pretty careful. You never know with, with mysterious things. I remember the cold fusion experiments where really only the original guys were able to make it work. Nobody else has managed it, which means probably there's some experimental failure, either of the original guys, most likely, or of all the people who are trying to copy it, less likely. Um, in the case of the EM engine, the original guy got it to work and NASA has got it to work. Nobody quite knows how it works. They know how to make one, but they or they don't know why it works. Okay, but there's a possibility there. Um, in the meantime, let's figure out if aliens could get here or anywhere using primitive methods, and if we could. And the primitive method is the mass driver. Basically, you blast pellets at, at the spaceship to speed it up, and at the far end you have it collide with slow moving pellets to slow it down. It's really primitive. Um, the pellets can be exploding pellets to help, but still. Um, so I'll give you a run through of the method, basically. It's a mission that, in all, is rather long because you have to allow um, time for the space flight, it's only going at up to 10% of the speed of light. And because you need pellets to slow the ship down, they have to be there in advance. They have to be ahead of the spaceship. Um, so it's a long-ish time scale. Not beyond the bounds of feasibility, but it would require um, considerable dedication on the part of a civilization to make it work. Um, So let's see how it works. I'll just go through it. You actually start preparing for the mission 110 years before the settler's spaceship departs. Okay. What you do is launch two slow streams of pellets out into space. What we're going to do is do a mission to Proxima Centauri, which is a little under four light years from the Earth. Okay. So you launch two streams of pellets, like little lumps of matter basically, um, using mass drivers. Um, there's a fast stream and a slow stream and you send those two streams out okay, in advance. So this starts 110 years before the launch of your settler spaceship. Um, Now, this little mass driver is relatively easy to build. We can build it on the moon or somewhere like that, or in the solar system, or two of them, I guess, and shoot out the pellets into space. Then, on year zero, we launch the spaceship with a thousand settlers and a hundred crew, or a hundred uh, extra people who will also be settlers but they they've got a secondary mission okay um, and we 
blast pellets travelling at 39,000 kilometres per second into the back end of this big spaceship um, to accelerate it for 89 years. <laughs> okay, off towards Proxima Centauri. These pellets are launched from a mass driver consisting of 100,000 segments, each three kilometres long. A hundred thousand segments, each three thousand meters, three kilometers long, to launch these pellets, and of course the pellets have to be very accurately aimed because they're going to be travelling several light years, right? They're going to be hitting the back of that spaceship, way, way off. Now, <clears throat> it's been shown mathematically. Obviously, we know that any beam of particles or lasers, even or light, it gradually spreads out due to minor errors uh, and differences in the particles and so on. Um, but it's been shown that if you send, if you have them electrically charged, or a little bit electrostatically charged, um, you can send them through rings, which were positioned in the solar system, and a computer can plot their course and just adjust the charge that's in the ring to steer them and accurately aim them, so that they can be made to be accurately aimed over a distance of up to, say, 10 light years. Uh, certainly five. Um, so we can do that. Um, obviously we have the engineering task of building these hundred thousand segments of three kilometres mass drivers all over the place, but um, that on the face of it is not completely impossible. <clears throat> They don't even have to be positioned all that accurately because if you're shooting through the rings, that will get the particles aimed right. Um, that's that's what you would do. Okay, so for 89 years, so 110 years, we're launching slow pellets, but then we launch the spaceship. Then for 89 years, the spaceship is accelerated with with fast pellets. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, the spaceship separates and the colony ship with a thousand settlers is left behind. It carries on travelling fast, but out we have a lead ship with a hundred crew in it which separates out, and this intercepts a fast, the fast stream of pellets for another 13 years. So it gets pushed on ahead, basically. Um, <clears throat> then, that takes us up to year 102 from launch. Then between years 102 and 122, the lead ship and a bit later the, the um, slow ship run into the slow pellet streams and they are slowly decelerated. Uh, this takes 20 years, so from 102 to 122. So 38 years after separating from the main ship, our little lead ship with a hundred crew will arrive at the Proxima Centauri system, still travelling at some speed, because um, the slow pellets still have to travel quite fast to get there in a reasonable time. Um, so it needs to slow down, and it will use fusion bombs probably for that, the hydrogen bombs, <coughs> um, with a, the pusher plate in front of it this time and bombs blowing blowing up in front of it slow it down and get it under control and it can enter the system <clears throat> and so 38 years later it gets to the system and once there it finds some asteroids or some rubble and it builds a mass driver that'll take it maybe nine years that, that's the schedule <clears throat> to build a mass driver then from year 136 to 155 it launches slow pellets at the main ship which is approaching. Uh, these pellets only move at 610 kilometers per second. Um, and again, they could be exploding pellets just to improve the uh, deceleration rate. Um, and they will strike the, the pusher plate on the front of the main ship with its thousand settlers and decelerate it, bring it into the system and from years 155 to 169, it will be coming into the system and slowing down more. And in year 169 after launch, it's 
ready. It'll be in orbit about Proxima Centauri, presumably, or maybe some planet, if they can get it to do that. And then all the settlers um, can join together and build a habitat somewhere, what, from asteroids or whatever. And that is the mass driver system. And on the face of it, it seems feasible. Um, <coughs> it's a long journey. I mean, the total time from launching your first pellets to arrival of the final settlers in Proxima Centauri is 279 years. <clears throat> it's 169 years of, f of flight and another 110 years of shooting pellets <laughs> into the distance. Um, so that's quite... and of course there will be some time spent building the mass drivers of course as well. Um, seems feasible. Now there may be obstacles in space that we don't know about. I mean we do know that a ship travelling at about a tenth of the speed of light would intercept a lot of space dust and particles. Um, and it's been calculated that over a distance of this four to ten light years they would suffer some grinding of the surface from these particles but not enough to slow it down appreciably um, and not enough to make holes in it. Um, and this is based on the density within the solar system of particles. Um, it would presumably be less in space because gravity is here, not there. Um, well, there's more of it here. Um, however, if there are big rocks in space, that of course would be a big problem if you're travelling at a tenth of the speed of light. Whacking into those would cause big trouble. Um, if the ship has a powerful pusher plate, pusher plate on the front to withstand thermonuclear explosions, though, it could probably withstand small collisions. Um, in, in, in the, the plate is designed specifically for withstanding collisions, after all, that's its job. Um, if we're shooting pellets at the spaceship and decelerating with more pellets, or some, ex some exploding pellets even, then um, it'll probably be okay. Um, if there are bigger rocks and our mission is destroyed, we would then have to conduct a proper survey of the interstellar space. We might, might do that in advance anyway, it would be sensible. Um, and we would need to survey our target star system anyway, perhaps using those little probes that Stephen Hawking has talked about, which can be pushed out with a simple laser beam uh, at close to speed of light. Um, and they could get there and survey all the space in between um, and target star systems, tell us what's there, is it worth going there, could we build a habitat there, who wants to live there, who wouldn't tell us that, but somebody would. Um, so it's feasible and once they're there they can build a civilization there over the next 5,000 years then they can build another spaceship and head off to the next star system and you can colonize the entire galaxy within 60 to 300 million years maybe even quicker probably even quicker humans being what we are um, but those are, that's like a minimum minimum rate. And so we would expect the galaxy to be populated already if there were aliens there, because it's doable. And going by ourselves, we have to assume we're pretty typical, because um, we have no other option really, there's nothing else to compare us with. Uh, we explore every single niche. I mean, we have people living in Antarctica now. Um, there are a few people living under the ocean, but not many. We don't have any proper habitats there. Um, space is the way to go. Uh, and we are going to have people under the ocean, aren't we? Proper settlers before long, I'm sure. I'd like to uh, live in some nice place and watch all the fish and stuff. Why not? Uh, I don't know if I want to live there all the time, but it would be a nice holiday home. <laughs> you know. Um, well, what do you think? Uh, comments below. Does it sound good? Would you go? As I say, I don't think I'd go somehow. Um, maybe if it was an O'Neill station with a full habitat inside, um, with 10,000 people plus and forests and trees and so on, maybe um, that might be okay. But only if I had a good reason for leaving the Earth. I don't think I'd go just for the sake of it, really. Anyway, what do you think? Like, subscribe, you know the drill. Bye for now.